Hi everybody, I'm Jimmy DeYoung here in Washington, D.C. Behind me is one of the most beautiful buildings in all of the world. You recognize it, I'm sure, as the White House, the residency for the President of the United States. I can tell you assuredly, it is the most powerful house in all of the world. The person who is President of the United States and lives in that house is the most powerful person in all of the world. I'm here to introduce you to a documentary we're going to do entitled Presidents, Politics, and Prophecy. Now let me just lay a little bit of background here for you so you can understand where we're going in this documentary. The Lord brought into existence human government 4,000 years ago with the purpose of being able to direct humankind through human world leaders. For those 4,000 years from Abraham until today, we've looked at Gentile world powers that have been the ones who really dictated how life would be played out all across the world. When you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 17, and in verse 17 it says, God put in the hearts of human world leaders to accomplish His will. That's basically the theme of this documentary. Up in verse 10 of Revelation 17, it says there are seven kings, Five have fallen, one is, and there's one yet to come. Now let me explain that just very briefly. We'll get into it more as we go through the documentary. We're talking about five kings that have fallen. And in the context of the passage, we're talking about Gentile world powers. The five kings that have fallen would be the five Gentile world powers the one is, of course, when Revelation was written, was the Roman Empire. And that was the time and the empire in play at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. The one yet to come is the revived Roman Empire. As I was studying those Gentile world powers, and I understood from my study that from the time of the Gentile world power, the Egyptian Gentile world power, until today, God had used human government to accomplish one major goal, and that was to bring the Jewish people back into the land of Israel. You see, when you want to know what God's doing in Bible prophecy, you look at the Jewish people and, in essence, the city of Jerusalem. So for 4,000 years, the Lord would use human government to bring the Jewish people back into the land. But then as I was studying that significant fact, I realized that over the last 45 years, the Lord has used presidents of the United States to make decisions in this house and with collaboration of their cabinet and their staff to come to some very important decisions internationally that was actually setting the stage, according to the ancient Jewish prophets, setting the stage for the scenario of Bible prophecy to be played out. That's what we're going to be looking at. Seven presidents making international decisions, setting the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. God indeed has in the past, is presently, and will in the future use human government to accomplish His will in the end-of-time scenario found in His Word. From here, we'll be traveling all over Washington, D.C. as we reveal the story of God using presidents, politics to lead into prophecy, His prophetic Word. Our first stop in my journey through Washington is to the Reflection Pond at the Lincoln Memorial. I want to lay out the foundation for our look at seven presidents who in the last 45 years have made political decisions that have set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. I want to take you on a journey through the seven Gentile world powers 
who God has used down through history to bring us to where the last seven presidents have come to power and then have been directed by God to fulfill His will. There will be seven Gentile world powers. Chapter 17 of the book of Revelation in verse 10 says, there were seven kings, five have fallen, one is and one is yet to come. It's so interesting that as you think that through, we come to the understanding of how the Gentile world powers would have played out down through the centuries. The first Gentile world power was the Egyptian Gentile world power. You might remember when Abraham got the Abrahamic covenant, the Lord said to Abraham, I will take you and your people, the Jewish people, out of the land into a foreign land for 400 years. Well, they went into Egypt, and Jacob took 70 of his family. Some 400 years later, book of Exodus chapter 12, we see that 600,000 men plus the children and the women, approximately 2 million people, they had come from a family now to a nation. 2 million people were going to make their way towards the promised land. Because of unbelief, they would travel in the wilderness for a 40-year period of time. Joshua takes them into the promised land. The Lord then gives them judges to direct how the humankind would be led by God on the earth at that time. But remember, he had instituted back in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, human government. And then in chapter 10 of Genesis, we have nations coming into existence. So he's going to use human government to lead nations in His will. He puts within the heart of human world leaders His will to be accomplished. Well, the Egyptian Gentile world power would be in place after the book of Joshua and into 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is the record of the first king of Israel, King Saul. 2 Samuel, the second king of Israel, was David. And then Solomon, David's son, would be the third king of Israel, and that's in 1 Kings. In 2 Samuel chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Lord is going to give Jerusalem to the Jewish people. Now this was 3,000 years ago, and that's very important to understand. 3,000 years ago in 2 Samuel chapter 5, God gives David, the city of Jerusalem, to be the political capital of the Jewish people. In chapter 6, David brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. That makes it the spiritual capital of the Jewish people. And God, in chapter 7, gives David the Davidic Covenant, which would make it the eternal capital of the Jewish people. King Solomon would build that temple and he would rule and reign for a 40-year period of time until 1 Kings chapter 11, at which time the 12 tribes were divided. Ten went into the north, they would be called Israel. Two stayed in the south, they would be called Judah. And that comes to the end of the Egyptian Gentile world power. The Assyrian Gentile world power would defeat the Egyptians and take over, and they would actually, in 722 B.C., take those ten tribes into captivity. Now, 2 Kings chapter 17 gives us the record of that capture of the ten tribes in the north, and in the 19th chapter of 2 Kings, we see that they came back, the Assyrians wanted to take the two southern tribes as well. However, that night the Lord showed up and killed 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers. We're going now through the Assyrian Gentile world power. And the last thing that happens in the Assyrian Gentile world power before the Babylonians defeat them is that Josiah, a very important king of Judah, he put that Ark of the Covenant into a secret secluded hiding place. Had he not done that, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, would not have been able to come into Jerusalem to defeat the Jewish people, to destroy the temple, and to devastate the city of Jerusalem and take the Jews into the captivity. They were there in the Babylonian captivity to accomplish the will of God. God was using human government. Jeremiah said in the 25th chapter and the 29th chapter, that he would take the Jews out of the land for a 70-year period of time because they failed to give the land a Sabbath, a Shabbat, 
as called for in Leviticus chapter 25. In fact, what happened at the end of the Babylonian captivity, just at the time when the Medo-Persian Empire was coming into place, as they defeated the Babylonians, all 12 tribes had come together. 2,500 years ago, all 12 tribes would be allowed by the Medo-Persian Empire, and the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, which was Cyrus, a man who God had prophesied would come to power, Isaiah chapter 44 and 45. Cyrus would allow 50,000 of the Jews to return to Jerusalem and build the temple. That's the book of Ezra chapter 2. That temple was finished, Ezra chapter 6. They had the dedicatory service, and that's how God used human government to get the Jews back into the land after the Babylonian captivity. And then at the time of Alexander the Great, who would put together a ragtag military operation, when he was 21 years of age and the next 11 years, by the time he was 32, he had captured the known world and became the leader of the world and was headquartered in the city of Babylon. What's so interesting again, the Lord was using human government to accomplish his will. One of the outcomes of Alexander was at the time of his death at 32, his kingdom was divided into four parts. One of those parts was headed up by a man named Antiochus Epiphanes. And in 168 BC, Keslov 25, the Jewish month of December, December the 25th, he desecrated the temple in Jerusalem by slaughtering a pig on the altar. But three years to the day later, they reconsecrated that temple they lighted the menorah, the seven-branch candelabra, and instead of being lighted for one day, which is all the virgin olive oil they had, it stayed lighted for eight days, and thus we have the Jewish holy day of Hanukkah. And based upon what happened during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, we see that's where we get December the 25th for the birth date of Jesus Christ. Well, those are the five that have fallen. The book of Revelation, chapter 17 and verse 10 says, five have fallen, there's one that is, and that would be the Roman Empire. And of course, it was the Roman Empire in place with a stability across the world at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. In fact, that stability was key. In Galatians chapter four and verse four, the Lord said, in the fullness of time, he brought forth his son, Jesus Christ. That Roman stability and the Roman road system across the entire continent of Europe and in the Middle East would allow for these missionaries that were to go forth and give the gospel message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It would give them a path by which they could follow a stability in the world. Remember, there was a common currency in the Roman Empire, the denarius, and they had a common language, Koine Greek. And when the Jewish people had been in the Babylonian captivity, the synagogue system came into place. So then these missionaries traveling down a Roman road with a denarius, the common currency, and that common language, Koine Greek, they could go into a synagogue and at that point in time start to reason with the Jews about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Well, that Roman Empire fell in 476 A.D. Though we understand the fall of the Roman Empire did take place, it did not disappear because the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, where it talks about the ten horns in verse 7, the little horn of verse 8, that's talking about the revival of the Roman Empire. You can determine that by looking at verses 23 and 24 of Daniel chapter 7 for the purpose of interpreting the passage of Scripture and the prophecy about the revived Roman Empire and the Antichrist. Verse 8 calls him the Little Horn, one of 27 names for the Antichrist, the Little Horn. And then in chapter 9 and verse 26 of the book of Daniel, he's referred to as the prince that shall come. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, the willful king. Matthew chapter 24, the false messiah. 2 Thessalonians, the wicked one, son of perdition, man of sin. Book of Revelation chapter 13, the beast out of the sea. And then of course in 1 John chapter two, we have the name we know him best by, the Antichrist. This was setting the stage for the last seven years of the prophetic events 
foretold through the ancient Jewish prophets to take place. This is key. But I've told you all along the way, the Lord used human government to establish this world to be ready to accomplish His will. Chapter 17 in verse 17 says, God will put into the hearts of human world leaders to accomplish His will. We see that Revelation says that's in the future. We'll be talking about that period of time, that very important seven-year tribulation period in another segment of this documentary. But we have to say God has used human government to accomplish His will and will continue to do so. Back in 1979, I was here in front of the White House. There was a demonstration going on that evening. Uh, this is not necessarily a demonstration. This is mostly a group of tourists who have come to see the White House. But it was on that evening that I came as a journalist covering what was going on in the White House, and the demonstrators from Iran were here. They were here at the White House because inside Jimmy Carter was meeting with the Shah of Iran. The Shah of Iran was a king, a, the Shah, in other words, a king or a despot located in Iran. He was ruling this nation and he had no human rights record that Jimmy Carter would agree with. In fact, that's what most of the conversation was about inside the White House, we found out later. Jimmy Carter ultimately would make political decisions. Remember, this documentary is entitled Presidents, Politics, and Prophecy. I'm setting up for the prophetic events that will happen as a result of what Jimmy Carter did. But that night, he told the Shaw that he was going to have to cut any relationship between the United States and Iran out because of his human rights record. Ultimately, the Shah was taken down in January of 1979. And guess who came in to fill that vacuum, a power base that had not been filled after the Shah fell? It was Ayatollah Ali Khomeini. He's the man who came in and established what is known today as the Islamic Revolution. That awakened the Islamic world. Islam had been prevalent throughout the world and there were adherents to the Islamic faith. They were practicing Muslims. But it awoke the potential for what the Islamic world could do when the Ayatollah Ali Khomeini came and set up not only the Islamic revolution, but an Islamic Republic, the state of Iran would follow the Sharia, the law of the Islamic Quran, their holy book. And that would be the beginning of the Islamic activities across the world that lead us to the location where we are. Remember, presidents playing politics lead into the prophetic scenario found in God's Word. In another section, when I'm talking about Bill Clinton as President of the United States, we'll talk about the two peace treaties that he brought together between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the Israelis and the Jordanians. At that point in time, I'll bring up Jimmy Carter's endeavor to bring the State of Israel and the Egyptians into an agreement. It's called the Camp David Accord. More on that when we get together and have a conversation about President Bill Clinton and how he, as a president, used the political arena to set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. This is one of the side entrances of the Hilton Hotel here in Washington, D.C. It was out that exit door that Ronald Reagan, President of the United States, stepped out to greet the people here gathered to cheer him on. He had been here at the Hilton Hotel addressing a trade union meeting. In fact, it was the 100th time that a sitting president had visited the Hilton Hotel. It was at this particular location. It's a national historic place. On March the 30, 1981, Ronald Reagan, who was president 
stepped out, and that afternoon at 2.27 p.m., there was an attempted assassination by John Hinckley, Jr. Roger, we want to go to the emergency room of George Washington. Go to George Washington fast. The president survived the attempt and indeed was able to go on and serve out his eight years as president of the United States. You know, there's many things that Ronald Reagan did as president of the United States. Each of the activities had an effect on the international scene and basically they set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. I'm going to go around to the entrance of the Hilton and sit and share with you some of the things that Ronald Reagan did during his eight years to allow human government to accomplish what the Lord wanted to do with humankind and bring into position in this world a prophetic scenario for the end times. Come along with me. Ronald Reagan survived that assassination attempt in 1981 and went on to become one of the most powerful presidents in the history of the entire United States of America. Many of the international decisions that Ronald Reagan would have made would affect what was going to happen in the future prophetically. In fact, in 1983, Ronald Reagan made his famous statement, the evil empire, he did that to a group of evangelicals meeting in Orlando, Florida. In 1987, he went to Germany, to Berlin, to the Brandenburg Gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. He used six words that would affect the entire world. Six words. That was 1987. 1989, that wall came down, but it was also the breakup, the collapse of the Eastern Bloc countries, and the European Union, with arms open, would welcome these Eastern Bloc countries, like Poland, Romania, Hungary, and the others, to become member states in the European Union. And of course, that ultimately resulted in 1991, to the fall of the Soviet Union. In 1991, it became the Russian Federation. Boris Yeltsin was elected president. He chose a man over in St. Petersburg, Russia, who was a part of the staff of the mayor of St. Petersburg. This young man came in, joined the presidential staff of Boris Yeltsin. And in 1999, Boris Yeltsin resigned as president and appointed this young man to become the president of the Russian Federation. That young man's name, Vladimir Putin. That was the beginning of the leadership of the entire Russian Federation by Vladimir Putin, which would indeed set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled, all under the leadership of the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, who started it and the domino effect took place until we had a man named Vladimir Putin, the leader of a coalition of nations out of the Middle East. We'll have more on that when we talk about the prophetic significance of all that happened during the time of President Ronald Reagan. On a very interesting, busy thoroughfare surrounding the what is referred to as the U.S. Naval Observatory here behind this fence. And it's also the location of the Vice President of the United States. Brings back memories to me because back in 1988, when George H.W. Bush was Vice President under Ronald Reagan, he decided he was going to run for the presidency. He called his friend Jerry Falwell, who then made contact with about 15 of us, we were invited to go to the vice president's home to have a meal together. Of course, the vice president setting up his candidacy for president of the United States. Had a wonderful time there and a great meal. And then we all took a photo op with the vice president and his wife, Barbara. I'll never forget 
That was a time when I was doing a lot of what we would refer to as youth conferences, the big super youth conference at Thomas Road in Lynchburg was one of my meetings as we would go throughout each and every year. Well, at that point in time, I had a big afro, and uh, I was standing out in a crowd any place I may be. But I'm there in the vice president's residency. I'm shaking hand with the vice president, George H.W. Bush. He's looking me right in the eye, shaking my hand. Barbara Bush, his wife, is not looking at the vice president. She's not looking at me. She happens to be looking at my hairdo. <laughs> and I have a photo in my office that has a caption underneath it. Who is this weirdo that we have here in our home uh, as Vice President of the United States? Ultimately, he would run for president. I am here today to announce my candidacy for President of the United States. There's several things that he was involved in decision-making politically as President of the United States that have a prophetic significance. One of the very important decisions that he made was a decision to work with the Israeli government as they would try to get the 15,000 Ethiopian Jews under Operation Solomon transferred from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia into Israel. Now that was an unbelievable airlift. 42 aircraft in the air at one time transporting 15,000 Ethiopian Jews which has a very interesting connection to Bible prophecy, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Another activity, a political decision that President George H.W. Bush made was to go into Iraq and try to shut down Saddam Hussein's adventure over into Kuwait. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait tonight the battle has been joined. That was in 1991 as well, and it was during that time that Judy and I were making our way into Israel. We got there in January of 1991, and the United States military was already into Iraq. It was at that time that Saddam Hussein had threatened to gas the Jewish people in the state of Israel, and Saddam Hussein would fire 39 scuds at Jerusalem. Well, not only at Jerusalem. Judy and I were living in Jerusalem. We thought every scud was coming to our apartment there in the city of Jerusalem. No, he was firing these scuds, and in fact, he didn't know where they were going. Scuds stood for sure, could use direction. He just fired them. He threatened that some of them would have some type of a chemical or a biological or a gas warhead on the scuds. He was going to gas the Jewish state of Israel. That's when the president, President George H.W. Bush, made a decision that he had to shut down Saddam Hussein. In a moment, we'll be talking about the president's son, George W. Bush, who also became president, and I'll bring together the connection between this father and son team as presidents of the United States, but in addition, the connection to Iraq, which, when you study the Word of God, is biblical Babylon. Indeed, presidents, in their political decisions, set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. The view behind me is the South Lawn of the White House, and of course the most powerful house in all the world. The location here, Washington, D.C., where the presidents have resided for many, many years. There have been seven presidents that have lived in that house over these last 45 years who have made political decisions that affect what's going to happen in the future. Bill Clinton is one such president. When Bill Clinton was president here in Washington, D.C., he invited world leaders to come to meet with him. One leader that met with President Bill Clinton more than any other was Yasser Arafat. He met 24 times there with the president in the White House. That is three times more than any other visitor to the White House for President Bill Clinton. Well, that was setting the stage ultimately for what the president, Bill Clinton, was going to do 
as it relates to the what is referred to the Oslo Accords, a peace treaty between the Palestinian people and the Israelis. Again, I want to remind you the theme of this documentary, how God would use human government to set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. And with the meetings in the White House between President Bill Clinton and Yasser Arafat, the leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, we could see down the road there would be a coming together of not only these two men, but another man, the Prime Minister of the State of Israel. They would sign a peace treaty. When we come to the part of this DVD documentary where I'll talk about the prophetic significance of the presidency of Bill Clinton, we'll give you more information and I'll bring in also President Jimmy Carter and how three peace treaties the Camp David Accord, the Oslo Accord, and the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan would affect not only the entire world, the Middle East, but it would have a very prophetic significance as the three peace treaties would be confirmed and bring about the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. More on that when we have an opportunity to talk about President Bill Clinton and his prophetic significance to what God's plan, the scenario in Bible prophecy, would come to pass in the end times. What a venue, the rooftop of the residency for the video team that's here in Washington, D.C. to do this very special documentary, Presidents, Politics, and Prophecy. Over there is the National Airport, Reagan National Airport, the Potomac River. You can see the Capitol building from here, the Washington Monument, the crane. That's the bird of Washington, D.C. It's always somewhere because the construction continues here in the nation's capital. And just down below us is the Pentagon. The Pentagon. At the southern end of the Pentagon on September the 11th, 2001, an airplane flew in to the Pentagon. It was the third attack in the United States. Two airplanes had taken down the Twin Towers in New York City. This was the third attack, and then they would bring an airplane down someplace in Pennsylvania into the fields, which was reportedly on its way to the White House. Judy and I were just at that location in Pennsylvania. At that southern end of the Pentagon, that airplane flew into the Pentagon and was a part of the attack, the Islamic attack on the United States in September of 2001. Where was the president? Well, George W. Bush was down in Florida and actually addressing an elementary school class. He got the word while talking to the children. He very casually got up and went out to take over as the leader of the United States of America. The presidency of George W. Bush will always be marked with the 9-11 attack on the United States of America. This would bring the president to the decision in 2003 to go into Iraq. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Now those who had given advice to the president told him that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. It was the attack on Iraq with shock and awe that punctuated the attack on Iraq and the taking down of Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein would ultimately be hanged as the leader of this Islamic nation who wanted to control the entire world. That had been the desire, and that came forth knowledge of that during the presidency of George W's father, H.W. Bush, when they understood that Saddam Hussein thought he was the incarnation of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king back 2,500 years ago. They watched as Saddam Hussein then spent a half a billion dollars in order to refurbish the city, the literal city of Babylon, some 58 miles out of downtown Baghdad. 
It was the decisions by the President of the United States, this time George W. Bush, that would enhance that opportunity for Saddam to refurbish the city of Babylon. And that actually was setting the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. You may well recognize the sights and the sounds here in Washington, D.C. In the background at the end of the mall would be the Washington Monument. The mall would then extend up to this location, which is the reflection pond, looking up at the back side of the Capitol itself. Now, when you look at that Capitol building today from the back side, it's not exactly like you've seen on national television. Because the last time you most likely saw that site, there were platforms up there, the president was going to be inaugurated, and it was an unbelievable scene here with the mall filled with thousands of people. It was in the year 2009, and in January, at the inauguration, let me sit down here a moment and think this through with you and reflect upon the inauguration of Barack Obama. He was inaugurated January 2009. Not long after that, in fact, less than six months, he took a foreign trip and he went to Cairo, Egypt. There at the University of Cairo, he addressed the Islamic world. I am honored to be in the timeless city of Cairo and to be hosted by two remarkable institutions. For over a thousand years, Ulozal has stood as a beacon of Islamic learning. And for over a century, Cairo University has been a source of Egypt's advancement. And together, you represent the harmony between tradition and progress. I'm grateful for your hospitality and the hospitality of the people of Egypt. And I'm also proud to carry with me the goodwill of the American people and a greeting of peace from Muslim communities in my country. You might remember I talked about President Jimmy Carter awakening the Islamic world when he took the Shah of Iran out of Iran and the Islamic Revolution took place. When President Barack Obama spoke to the Islamic world, he emboldened the Islamic world to come forward with their plan, their mission for the future. That was 2009, 2011. Well, a lot of things took place then. The Arab Spring began. It began in Tunisia. From that point in time, it jumped over into Egypt, then over to Libya, and then finally into Syria. Now, many events unfolded during those days in 2011. December of 2011, President Barack Obama withdrew the United States soldiers from Iraq which actually then opened up the sectarian violence that has continued even until this day, the Shiites against the Sunnis. In 2011, in addition to that, there was the time when Hosni Mubarak was brought down and the Arab Spring took charge of the nation of Egypt. And then Colonel Gaddafi fell. 2011 was a very eventful year in the Islamic world all based upon a speech that Barack Obama made in Cairo, Egypt. 2013, Barack Obama drew a line in the sand. He told the Syrians, you step over that line by using chemical weapons, you're going to have to deal with certain consequences. Well, nobody did anything after President Bashar Assad did indeed use chemical weapons against his own people in the period of a civil war that is continuing with violence and death and over 500,000 Syrians already killed. And that was 2013, another eventful year in the presidency of Barack Obama. Finally, in 2016, Barack Obama brought to the table the leaders of Iran, many other European leaders, and they negotiated a deal called the Iranian Nuclear Deal. In essence, if you understand the deal, you understand that Iran was given the permission sometime down the line to develop a nuclear weapon of mass destruction. Jimmy Carter awakened the Islamic world. But President Barack Obama emboldened the Islamic world 
to do what they're doing, to endeavor to set up a worldwide kingdom, a caliphate, a caliphate which would be a dominion over all of the world. You see, presidents, when they make decisions, especially international decisions, they will have effects, eternal effects, because President Obama was actually setting the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. We'll deal with that in just a few moments when we talk about President Barack Obama and prophecy. I just walked out of the lobby of what may well be the most famous hotel in all the world today. The reason is the Trump International Hotel is the location that Donald Trump, when he was a real estate developer, purchased here in Washington, D.C. This, of course, was the old post office building. And in essence, it dates back to the beginning of governmental offices here in Washington, D.C. Right here on Pennsylvania Avenue, and it's not too many blocks away from here where Donald Trump now lives today. Well, in our documentary on presidents, politics, and prophecy, we really don't have enough background to go into President Donald Trump. Many praise him and think he's the greatest president that's ever lived. Others think he's very arrogant and very willful type of a leader. There are those who demonstrate in the streets. Women, for example, don't like the president. But uh, many women are standing behind and working for the President of the United States. Well, he's made some very interesting decisions early on in his presidency. Some military actions, for example, like uh, sending a Tomahawk missile into the area of Syria because of the chemical weapon attack there. We're going to have to watch and see what President Trump is going to do during his presidency. But I could almost guarantee you, based upon past history of the last six presidents, Donald Trump will make some political decisions that will affect this world stage that is going to be the location where Bible prophecy, the scenario that God has for the end times, is going to be played out. Very interesting location. Donald Trump owns this hotel, lives down the street in his house, the White House the most powerful man in the world today. Now we take a look at the prophecy aspect of Jimmy Carter. He was president of the United States. We talked about that. And some of the decisions that he made, some political decisions, had international consequences, and of course they do set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. For example, when he brought down the Shah of Iran, we were talking about that on the other side of the White House. This is the southern side of the White House, the residency for the most powerful person in all the world. And Jimmy Carter met in this White House with the Shah of Iran, took him down, the Ayatollah Ali Khomeini came into power. At that point in time, the Islamic Revolution took place, and the Islamic world was awakened as to what they might be able to do in all of their plan, their mission to set up a worldwide caliphate. Well, with the Islamic world awake and operating, we have seen many things happen as a result of the radicalism of the Islamic faith. One thing we saw we saw Persia of biblical times. That's the book of Ezekiel. We know Persia today as modern day Iran. And Iran has been in the development of a nuclear weapon of mass destruction. Been a lot of debate as to how that may play out and even if it will play out. But it was all started with the Islamic Revolution taking place and the Islamic Republic in Iran coming into existence. This will be one of the major players in an alignment of nations that will come against the Jewish state of Israel in the last days. Now that's one aspect of the presidency of Jimmy Carter relating to Bible prophecy. We'll talk about that other aspect that Jimmy Carter was involved in. 
he went to Camp David, which is, of course, the retreat center for the presidents down in Maryland. And there he met with the leaders of Egypt and Israel that came up with the Camp David Accords. Separate helicopters brought the Middle Eastern leaders to the remote meeting ground on the evening of September 5th. Warm greetings from the president and America's first lady, Rosalind Carter, were waiting for President Sadat and later for Prime Minister Begin as they stepped onto the landing pad at Camp David. There was no hint of the momentous task facing the three men in the cheerful, easy manner they displayed upon arriving for what was called an open-ended summit, a meeting with no time limit for success or failure either. When I talk about the prophetic aspect of President Bill Clinton, we'll bring all of the prophetic significance to these peace treaties that have been established. So we'll hold on this Camp David Accord until we talk about Bill Clinton. Certainly, the political aspects of what Jimmy Carter did, did set the stage for the prophetic to be fulfilled. We'll deal with that, especially the treaties that came together through both Jimmy Carter, President, and President Bill Clinton in just a bit later on this DVD documentary. One of the most recognizable buildings in all of the world is the Capitol right here in Washington, D.C. The Supreme Court behind me, over here to the right would be the office buildings for the congressmen, the members of the United States Senate and the House of Representatives. And here's the legislative body. You have the judicial body, the legislative body, and of course at the White House, the executive body. The legislative body is divided into two houses for 135 United States congressmen or women, and then you have 100 men or women as United States senators. When I think about Ronald Reagan and what he did with six words, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. What he did had a domino effect that not only brought the wall down, made a collapse of the Eastern Bloc countries to then be included in the European Union as member states, but it also, after Boris Yeltsin was president for about nine years of the Russian Federation, he appointed Vladimir Putin. Now we have two major personalities and two major different political powers that will be in operation during the seven-year tribulation period and at the very beginning of that seven-year tribulation period. As we have the House of Representatives and the United States Senate, we will have in that seven-year tribulation period, in the first six months, a revival of the Roman Empire. That revival of the Roman Empire will come about from the foundation for that revival of the old Roman Empire, which is the European Union. They are the infrastructure for what's going to happen, a political, economic, governmental power that will play a key role as that unit, that European Union will bring forth the Antichrist. That's Daniel chapter 7. Verse 7 talks about the ten horns, the revived Roman Empire. Verse 8 talks about that little horn, one of 27 names for the Antichrist. Well, the European Union infrastructure for the revived Roman Empire will ultimately result in the fulfillment of prophecy. Revived Roman Empire comes into play. They go to Rome. That's where they get their power with the Antichrist, and they set up their political operation. Meanwhile, there's going to be a coalition of nations that come together in the Middle East, and we will mention them and tell you who they are when I talk about the prophetic aspect of the presidency of Barack Obama. We'll come to the understanding that Ezekiel 38 talks about Russia. Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Tagarma would be Turkey, Russia of course being Magog. Persia in verse 5 would be Iran. Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan is Ethiopia, and Libya of course is Libya. Now there are a group of nations that form that coalition, along with the two in Psalm 83, now that would then include Saudi Arabia and Lebanon, and in Daniel chapter 11, in the north, Syria, in the south, Egypt. These nations will form under the leadership of Russia, which of course 
our President Ronald Reagan was responsible when he used those six words, tear that wall down, Mr. Gorbachev. The domino effect ultimately brought down the Soviet Union. Vladimir Putin comes to power. This sets up two major powers in the last days. The European Union, revived Roman Empire, the coalition of nations under Russia, which would be the Ezekiel 38 coalition. These two power structures at the beginning of the tribulation period will vie for the leadership of this world. Vladimir Putin, if he is the Gog of Ezekiel chapter 38, will bring forth this coalition of nations to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. The Lord will intercede at that time, give the Jewish people a victory. Meanwhile, the European Union will continue on throughout the seven-year period of time. You see, presidents, when they make decisions, political decisions, they are actually in these days being used by God through human government to set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. From this vantage point, I've been thinking about presidents, politics, and prophecy. I come now to the prophetic section on President George H. W. Bush. In a moment, we'll be talking about his son, George W., and the relationship the two father and son had with Babylon and the end result of Bible prophecy during the tribulation period. But right now, let me just focus on what George H.W. Bush did at the beginning of his presidency. He played a key role in the greatest airlift that Israel was ever involved in. On May the 24th, 1991, George H.W. Bush, then President of the United States, worked out the details for the Israelis to fly into Addis Ababa, Ethiopia and transport them through this wonderful airlift some 15,000 Ethiopians from Addis Ababa to Jerusalem. That was a Friday afternoon when airplanes do not fly in Israel. But that afternoon, that Friday, 42 aircraft took off from Jerusalem, flew to Addis Ababa, picked up 15,000 people, and in the next 24 hours, transported them to Jerusalem. In fact, one 747 that normally would carry about 450 people took out every seat. They had 1,087 people on the aircraft, and actually seven babies were born in the flight from Addis Ababa into Jerusalem. My wife Judy and I, both of us journalists in Jerusalem, went down to cover the arrival of these Ethiopian immigrants the making Aliyah, in other words, immigrating to Israel. We were unable to communicate with them. We didn't know their language. They didn't know ours. Neither of us knew Hebrew that well. And so we went down to assist them in the meal that they are having upon their arrival. They had a boiled egg. They had a container of yogurt and some cucumbers, tomatoes, and onions, just normal Israeli fare. Well, they didn't know what to do with a boiled egg. They'd never seen a boiled egg because in Ethiopia they were starving to death. So they would kill the chicken before the hen would lay an egg. I cracked the egg to help an old man know how to approach eating the egg. That caught on across the crowd. Then I went up to a lady who had a baby strapped on her back. I opened up the yogurt container, started to feed the baby, and then the lady, that caught on. And while I was standing there doing that, tears started streaming down out of my eyes. You see, the Bible says that in Isaiah 18, there will be a people coming out of Ethiopia, making their way back to Jerusalem. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 10 says it will be the Ethiopians, and they're described as the prize. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 20 says the prize are the people, the Jewish people from around the four corners of the earth going back into Jerusalem. It was a decision, and with the assistance of President George H. W. Bush, the President of the United States, making a political decision that set the prophetic scenario of God's Word in place where it could be fulfilled. Presidents making those decisions, those political decisions, do set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled.
Well, we're here at the southern part of the lawn leading up to the White House. You can see there are a number of young people from different schools across the United States for their yearly trip to Washington, D.C. to learn, to see the sights, to have a great opportunity of finding out more about the political aspect of our United States of America. We talked about President Bill Clinton and his political activities that would actually set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. It was in this White House when Bill Clinton was president, he invited Yasser Arafat some 24 times to meet with him. That was three times more than any other world leader that was invited during the Clinton administration to visit in the White House. Interestingly, at this same White House, there would be two very important events that would take place. Not only did he bring Yasser Arafat into the White House, but he brought both Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin, Prime Minister of Israel, to this White House to sign the Oslo Accords. It was a peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinian people. From afar in Jerusalem, where Judy and I are stationed as journalists, we watched on a large screen television how in the yard of the White House, Yatsak Rabin, Prime Minister of Israel, Yasser Arafat, Chairman of the PLO, and President Bill Clinton would come together to sign the Oslo Accord. In addition to that, he would then come into the Middle East, and that would take place in October of 1994 in the Arava, the southern end of the Dead Sea area and down towards the Red Sea. They would meet together, again, this time President Bill Clinton, Yitzhak Rabin, Prime Minister of Israel, but replacing Yasser Arafat would be King Hussein of Jordan, and they would sign this peace treaty right here, the Treaty of Peace between the State of Israel and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, 26 October 1994. The significance of this, prophetically, is what it says in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, because it talks about at the beginning of that seven-year period of time, referred to as the tribulation, Jesus made that statement in Matthew 24 verse 29, at the time of the tribulation, that seven-year period of judgment upon the face of the earth, the Antichrist would confirm a peace treaty between Israel and all of her neighbors. The significance in that statement is he will not sign a peace treaty, but confirm a peace treaty. Peace treaties on the table, never normalized and not working. That's exactly what's happening with this peace treaty, the Treaty of Peace between Israel and Jordan. It's never been normalized. It's not working, as is the case with the Camp David Accord, peace treaty between Israel and Egypt and the Oslo Accords, a peace treaty between the State of Israel and the Palestinian people. The Antichrist, that world dictator, the most powerful political leader in all the world, will come with all his power to the Middle East and confirm these three treaties. By the way, that word again means confirm, not sign. The word in Hebrew, gabar, confirm, make them stronger, strengthen them. That's what's going to happen, and in fact, that starts the clock ticking on what is referred to, as we've already mentioned, the time of the tribulation, seven-year period of time following the rapture of the church. So we now do see that presidents who do political activities in their service as president of the United States will be setting the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. It's here right behind me where the White House is located that President Bill Clinton did bring together world leaders to sign a peace treaty which ultimately would be confirmed by the Antichrist. Bible prophecy quickly coming to fulfillment as political leaders make decisions affecting our world today. As I stand here at this venue, from this rooftop overlooking the city of Washington, D.C., I'm amazed at what happens in this unique city of the world. 
In Washington, D.C., presidents will make political decisions that set in place the scenario for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. Just a moment ago, we were talking about the presidency of George W. Bush and some nine months after he had been inaugurated right here in Washington, he had to face the crisis on the United States with an attack on the Twin Towers, the Pentagon, and then of course that plane that went down in the fields of Pennsylvania reportedly headed towards the White House. Well, that would cause then in 2003 the Bush administration to send the military into Iraq, which would further set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. Every nation in this coalition has chosen to bear the duty and share the honor of serving in our common defense. To all the men and women of the United States Armed Forces now in the Middle East, the peace of a troubled world and the hopes of an oppressed people now depend on you. Prophetically, what was going to take place, as was the case when George W's father, George H. W. Bush, would go into Iraq to try to deal with Saddam Hussein, who had sent his military forces into Kuwait. At that point in time, Saddam Hussein thought he was the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar, and he was refurbishing the literal city of Babylon. Now I say the literal city of Babylon because that city has never been destroyed completely as Bible prophecy calls for. In the book of Isaiah chapters 13 and 14, Jeremiah 50 and 51, it says that Babylon will be destroyed completely, never to be lived in again. That's not the case today. In fact, the former prime minister of Iraq, al-Maliki, was born and raised in the city of Babylon. The Bible tells us that in the last days, from the midway point of the tribulation all the way to the end of the seven-year period of time of judgment, that Iraq, or should I say biblical Babylon, will be a major player. The Antichrist will go to Babylon for the purpose of setting up a one-world economic, political, governmental system. That's at the time in history when those still on the earth will have to receive a mark in the forehead or the back of the hand in order to be able to buy and sell. If you read through the book of Revelation chapter 18, you'll see that the merchants wax rich in partnership with the Antichrist. Well, the last thing that Jesus Christ is going to do is destroy that city of Babylon. Revelation chapter 18, verses 10, 17, and 19 says the great city Babylon will be destroyed in one hour. If you go back to the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation, starting in verse 17, it tells how that will take place. The greatest earthquake to ever hit the earth since the creation of the earth will take place at Babylon, dividing the city. Then at that point in time, hail will fall out of the heavenlies, weighing 75 pounds apiece, and Babylon will be completely destroyed, fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah. The stage was set for all of this to take place when President George H.W. Bush and his son, President George W. Bush, got involved in the activities in Iraq, our biblical Babylon. Decisions by presidents, political decisions, do indeed set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. And in fact, the last thing that Jesus Christ does before he steps down in Jerusalem is to destroy the city of Babylon. Bible prophecy will indeed be fulfilled. Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. As I was talking about the presidency of Barack Obama, we talked about the international events in his presidency. We were talking about, of course, his speech in Cairo. But there's two major decisions that he made while president as it relates to the Supreme Court. 2009, he appointed Justice Stedemeyer. And then in 2010, he appointed 
Justice Kagan. This resulted in a vote in the Supreme Court in 2015 for same-sex marriage. Now that does play into Bible prophecy. Jesus talked about it over in the book of Luke chapter 17. He makes the statement, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. You have to go back to Genesis chapter 19 to understand the days of Lot. And then you come forward and you look at the book of Romans chapter 1, where it talks about uh, the sin of homosexuality. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you see what Paul had to say to the church in the last days. In perilous times, these things shall happen. And one of the things that Paul talked about was unnatural sexual relationship. Well, that does have a very key component in the Bible prophecy scenario that's going to unfold in the last days as it was in the days of Lot. But let me get back to the international political decisions that President Barack Obama made. He brought together all the what we understand today as the enemies of the Jewish state of Israel, the Islamic states throughout the entire Middle East and in fact throughout the entire world. When you think about the Islamic states, you have to remember the lowest common denominator in a coalition of nations that will come against the Jewish state of Israel in the last days, this alignment of nations, their lowest common denominator, they're all Islamic. You'll have to go to the passages in Ezekiel chapter 38, Psalm 83, and Daniel chapter 11, starting in verse 40. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 38, you see Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Tagarma in verses 2 and 6. That's modern-day Turkey. In verse 5, it says Persia. That's modern-day Iran. Then it says Ethiopia, which in the Hebrew would be Cush. And you have to then understand that Cush would represent Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan. And it lists in verse 5 of Ezekiel 38, Libya, which is one of the major Islamic states in the Middle East today. Over in the book of Psalm, chapter 83, it talks about these nations coming against the Jewish state of Israel to wipe them off the face of the earth, that the name of Israel may be forgotten forever. In verse 6, it talks about the Ishmaelites. That would be modern-day Saudi Arabia. And then in verse 7, the last one in verse 7 would be Tyre, Tyre and Sidon, which would be modern-day Lebanon. As we go to the book of Daniel, chapter 11, starting in verse 40, it mentions the king of the north and the king of the south. Early on in chapter 11, we see a description of the king of the north. That would be modern-day Syria and the king of the south, modern-day Egypt. Now these are the nations that are going to come together to form a coalition to try to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And the fact is, as we look at these nations and what's going on, for example, today in Syria, you have Russia, you have Iran, you have Turkey, and of course the Syrian people. Bashar Assad wants to go into the Golan Heights, take it back. He said, I will do this diplomatically, or I will do it militarily. And of course, the book of Isaiah chapter 17 says that at this time in history, when this coalition of Islamic states come against the Jewish state of Israel, the city of Damascus will be destroyed. Now you might better understand how the prophetic scenario in God's word is coming much better into focus because of one president's decision to embolden the Islamic world, setting the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. Earlier on this DVD documentary, I talked about the President of the United States named Donald Trump. We talked about he's just now into office, and we don't know all that this President's going to do in the first four years of his possible eight years of President of the United States. This is very interesting to look at because we don't know how it's going to play out, so it's difficult for us to talk about the prophetic aspect of the presidency of Donald Trump and how he will affect this world and set the stage for Bible prophecy 
to be fulfilled. May I just suggest that we watch him closely, study the prophetic word of God, and see how they do come together. I would also like to suggest the book of Daniel, chapter 11, which is key to understanding the end times and what's going to take place during that seven-year period of time referred to as the tribulation. We talked about Ronald Reagan and what he did. Six words he brought down that wall between East Berlin and West Berlin. Take that wall down, Mr. Gorbachev. And the domino effect would bring about the fall of the Soviet Union. Those Eastern Bloc countries became a part of the European Union, which we've already said would be at least the infrastructure for the revived Roman Empire. After Boris Yeltsin resigned as president of the Russian Federation, he appointed Vladimir Putin to be president, and from that time until this, we know the history of the president of Russia. I've just indicated to you there will be two major powers when we move into the tribulation period, the revived Roman Empire and the Middle Eastern coalition of nations headed up by Russia that will try to destroy the Jewish state of Israel. Well, out of that revived Roman Empire comes the Antichrist. And when you look at Daniel chapter 11, starting in verse 36 through verse 39, we see a description of the Antichrist, one who will be very arrogant, a willful king, the text tells us. He'll be hated by women. He'll also be responsible for being a military genius. But he comes to this world from nowhere to become the most powerful political leader in all of the world. At that point in time, this coalition of nations, their basic lowest common denominator, they are Islamic in their faith, they will form an alignment to try to destroy the Jewish state of Israel. They'll be headed up in that alignment by Gog in the land of Magog. As of today, I would have to say that would be Putin in the land of Russia. That coalition will be defeated. And then the Antichrist will continue his activities throughout the entire seven-year period of time. And the next thing, Daniel chapter 11, verse 45 says, he will tell the Jewish people to put up their temple on the holy mountain of God between the seas. The Sea of Galilee in the north and the south, the Red Sea. In the east, the Dead Sea, and in the west, the Mediterranean Sea. Between those four different seas is the holy mountain of God, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Antichrist will tell the Jewish people they can put up their temple on that holy mountain of God. And then 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 says he will go into that temple, desecrating the temple, claiming to be God Almighty himself. We're not sure exactly what Donald Trump is going to do in his administration that will further setting the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. Only time will tell that. What we do know is the prophetic scenario that I have just described will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled because another president in his political decision will set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. On this documentary entitled Presidents, Politics, and Prophecy, we've traveled to the different venues here in Washington, D.C. to reveal the story how God has used human government in the past, is presently using human government, and will in the future use human government. I gave a special emphasis to the last seven presidents over a 45-year period of time decisions in the political arena that they would make which would set the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. God brought the ancient Jewish prophets to write the scenario, pre-write history. And as we've been watching for 45 years, these presidents from that house, the White House behind me, have been making decisions key to setting the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. I would challenge you to study God's Word and see how this is the case, how God 
has used, is using, and will use human government in the future to accomplish his will and to fulfill the prophetic scenario that has been written by the ancient Jewish prophets years and years ago, hundreds and thousands of years ago, to tell us how it would all play out in the end times. Now you must recognize the next event in God's calendar of activities is not what we've been talking about on this documentary. The next event in God's calendar of activities is the rapture of the church. He will shout, the archangel will shout, the trump of God will sound, and those of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will be caught up to meet him in the air. And then after the rapture, everything we've revealed to you in this documentary will play out in the seven-year tribulation period leading up to the return of Jesus Christ back to this earth to set up his kingdom to rule and reign, and in fact, from the city of Jerusalem. That rapture, the next event, should cause each and every one of us to make certain we're prepared for that next prophetic event to be fulfilled. And then it's prepared by knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, which is very simple. It's as simple as ABC. You have to admit you're a sinner, believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he did that to give us eternal life, and then call upon him to save you. That's what needs to be done. Salvation is preparation. And then we must live pure and be productive until he does come. Everything on this documentary has to be evidence that we're quickly approaching the time of the rapture. Make sure you're prepared and keep looking up until.